Okay. Carrie, I get to introduce you. Yes. Carrie, we're going to get this thing started. It's 9 o'clock, and we all want to be good students, right? And good people and start on time, right? Okay, cool. Well, welcome. My name is Augie. I'm your MC. I hope that uh, I can keep you not only entertained but informed as we move through the morning and the day. All right, Carrie, you ready? You have a really big last name. Yusevich, right? Is that it? Yurosevich, close. Close. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, introducing the governor is Carrie Yu. Yurosevich. All right. everybody and good morning. Um, it's really nice to be here. This is our family's favorite island. Um, you're all blessed to live on the Garden Island and so it's a real gift to be here. Um, I'm Carrie Rosevich, lead for Early Childhood Action Strategy and the Commit to Keiki co-chair. Um, I'd like to mahalo all of you uh, for prioritizing mental health, for destigmatizing this topic, and for ensuring that our very youngest Keiki up to our kupuna, are healthy, happy, and hopeful. It's an honor um, for me to introduce Governor Josh Green. Um, Governor Green is a proud husband, father, and physician. For the past 20 years, Governor Green cared for Big Island families as a doctor. He served in the State House of Representatives and the State Senate from 2004 to 2018. As chair of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, he passed Luke's Law, which provides care for children with autism spectrum disorder, as well as tobacco and e-cigarette regulations, which increased the legal age for purchasing tobacco and e-cigarettes to, to 21. Passionate about housing solutions, Governor Green helped create Kauhale communities to get unsheltered veterans, kupuna, and other vulnerable populations into safe housing options. These efforts are ongoing and continue to be top priorities for our governor. In his first six months in office, Gover Governor Green has made significant progress in ensuring that Hawaii's keiki lead a happy, healthy, trauma-free life, partnering with the Commit to Keiki initiative. Governor Green understands that the cost of paradise has skyrocketed and that families are struggling to work and live in Hawaii. He worked with the legislature to increase several tax credits. They include earned income tax credit, food and excise tax credit, child and dependent care tax credit, to put more than 120 million back into the pockets of working families. Um, he's been working closely with his lieutenant governor to make progress on the state's goal to provide universal access to preschool for all three and four-year-olds by building and staffing more preschool classrooms and more than tripling the funding for the Preschool Open Doors Subsidy Program. Round of applause. Uh, he is ensuring access to health care across the state by increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates, to Medicaid, Medicare levels, establishing a loan repayment program for healthcare professionals, and staffing the state's Office of Wellness and Resilience. Yay. Yay. He introduced a bill to create an infant and early childhood men mental health program in our Department of Health to ensure that our youngest Keiki get a happy and healthy start. Although the bill did not pass, it is an important program in Governor's overall mental health strategy. And finally, he is committed to ensuring children have a safe place to live and grow. He secured almost $700 million in his first budget to reduce homelessness and provide affordable housing for Hawaii's families. <laughs> On behalf of Commit to Keiki, I'd like to thank Governor Green for his commitment to Hawaii's youngest Keiki and for continuing to engage with us as we work together to improve the future for our Keiki and their families. Hello. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to quickly jump up and get my uh, pointer, the clicker, and then I'm going to come back and just walk around and do this. Right. Okay, so uh, thank you for welcoming me to Kauai. And uh, this is just a great opportunity for us to share. Uh, please call me Josh. 
I am your governor. I'm also a family doctor and thank you. And the ER doc. And my life has been those things. So what I did want to share before I just do this this brief presentation, which is kind of just like an overview of what, what's possible and what's now available to us. What I want to share is that everything that I do is through the lens of those experiences of seeing people. My job was on Big Island in very rural uh, southern Big Island, Kau. And it was through that lens where I saw what challenges we have. And so a lot of the things that I'm fortunate enough to carry with me to the governorship is that perspective and the needs of our people. And I'm hopeful that everything that we do in these coming years is a reflection of what our people really need. And we're governing from a, a sense of values based on that. So we constantly think what will be good for our Ohana, what will be truly caring, and what do we really need with an eye to what's pra you know, practical. What do we actually think we can do with resources to make a big difference. So that's kind of the framework. So mahalo to all of you. Mahalo Kerry, mahalo Augie. He says he's half Filipino. I don't know which half it is. <laughs> Top half, I think. Uh, so Augie is just one of the most great <laughs> and funny people. So got him now. Um, so that's where we're gonna come from today. And don't hesitate to Raise your hand, interrupt me, talk, and so on. I'm gonna go through a bunch of stuff. So, thank you guys, beautiful. So what are we trying to do? We're actually trying to do things differently. Not that people haven't done wonderful work over the years, incredible things, but we wanna really move the needle now that we've seen how people struggle. We have, of course, come through COVID, which created its own huge ripple effect through all humankind, especially we in neighbor islands in Hawaii who were very isolated. It was hard. No doubt it was hard. It left us isolated and traumatized in many ways. I personally believe that the whole nation, the whole world, is suffering to a degree like a post-traumatic stress disorder that's connected to isolation and fear, concern from the virus. And so we're coming out of that, not that it's totally gone, but it affects us. It affects our kids. It affects our mental health care system. It affects our ability to deal with addiction. So a lot of what we're rebuilding now that I get to be governor for a few years is that. It addresses that. So when I say we're innovating, what do you see what we're doing? We're changing things that I had hoped to change for years. Now we're just going to actually do it. So uh, one of the things that I've believed in for a long time, and I'm, I'm here with a dear friend, Curtis Toma. Curtis, raise your hand. He's a great dude, OK? Curtis, physician, also works in our government. Curtis and I met back in 2001 on Big Island when he was a family doctor in Puna and I was a family doctor in Kau. And we got to see firsthand then, which is now 22 years ago, exactly the needs of our families. Now, when I came to Kau to be the doctor, all the way, I came originally to be in Hilo. They said, you're gonna come work in the big city of Hilo, right? They recruited me. And then the doctor quit down in Kau and they said, just drive 65 miles south and it's on the left-hand side and that's where your clinic is gonna be. And at that point, I inherited essentially a big panel of patients, extraordinary people, about 4,000 Filipino uh, patients, 4,000 Hawaiians, and about 15 witness relocation patients from New York City, okay? <laughs> and that was my practice for a bunch of years. And I saw over and over and over again what it meant to not have access to drug treatment or uh, treatment for bipolar disorder, or maybe family was struggling and one of the parents was incarcerated and the other really struggling with two or three jobs and driving all the way from Kau all the way up to Hilo or Kona, really hard, then raised by the grandparents. So a lot of these things are meant to fix that and fix the, the impact of those um, tough times. So first, the Hawaii Health Corps. So it was that loan forgiveness program that I got to pay back. I supported for four years in Kau and they forgave all my loans as a doctor, which meant that I could do other things, policy work, ran for the State House of Representatives, met good people like Curtis, and he also did loan forgiveness. So that's what this program is, but we learned from it. Now at first, that program, the federal program, which still exists, is just for essentially doctors in primary care settings in rural areas. What I saw was that we need people on the whole continuity of the healthcare system, ranging of course from doctors, some primary care doctors, maybe even some specialists who our kids need to see or our grandparents need to see, 
also social workers, also community health workers, also psychologists, all the people, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. That's what this is. Once and for all, this is a $30 million initial investment in just two years, and then it's gonna be $15 million every year, that's the plan, to create what we're calling the Hawaii Health Corps, which will be about 800 healthcare professionals of all shapes and sizes and flavors and everything to work anywhere in Hawaii where there's need. And I'm also making it more straightforward as far as need goes, which is to say need means not just exactly where you live, although all of the neighbor islands will qualify, but also where people have a high number of individuals on Medicaid. So anywhere that 20% of our population is um, in Medicaid or Medicare, you would also qualify, which means it's essentially everywhere, except for like Kahala and maybe a couple other rich bastard places, okay? So it's everywhere. And this way we will be able to do loan repayment everywhere in our state and really recruit our young people that maybe they went to Kapa or wherever, they went to Kau High School, they maybe then went on to college but had to go to the mainland to get their training now owe $95,000, repay that loan, we're gonna repay it. So you will see the details of this this summer and it's a huge thing. Any of you guys are sitting around having loans working in healthcare, get your loans forgiven in this program meant to be a big boon to bring a lot of people into healthcare from social work, like I said, on through the whole spectrum. So that's the first thing. And that also deals with the health disparities. We all know that, for example, if a person is Hawaiian, they have chronic disease 10 years earlier and they are likely to die eight years earlier than other populations. My wife's family, for example, okay, she lost her mom when she was 43. She died of stomach cancer didn't have access to screening, didn't have access to the specialty care she needed. It happens all the time. So this is meant to solve that problem. We all hear about like why and I, constant, constant health disparities, real tough, a lot of self-harm. We wrestle with that here in Kauai. Lots of people need to see a counselor, need to see a psychologist, probably just need to have better access to some opportunities in life. And it gives us a chance, it gives us a chance to kind of change their trajectory and just have the wonderful life that we all know we can have here on the island and in the state. So that's the first program, which is a complete game changer. We'll be the first state to essentially commit to forgiving anyone's health care debt that comes and works in the state of Hawaii. And we will prioritize totally our local people. And then we'll have a committee, they'll just select them over and over again. And I expect private sector monies to come too, to match that money. So by the end of my term, I can't imagine a scenario where we don't tell anybody in healthcare we will forgive your loans as long as you work um, in any area of need for our community. So that's a big, big move to stop the gap in healthcare. So that's the first thing. Next thing, investing in our healthcare system. So we also know that our neighbor islands don't have as much access to healthcare because the facilities get old and beat up, right? So we're changing that. The benefit, I suppose, of having a neighbor island-based governor, uh, though I'm now on a walk for my office and job, is that we're going to really fund all of the repairs and maintenance of our hospitals and expand them. So, for example, although you guys are going to also see big investments here in our local facilities across the other side of the island, uh, Hilo, for example. Hilo and Kona, that region represents half of all transfers that have to go to Oahu when someone doesn't have a psychiatrist, doesn't have a surgeon, and so on. So they're gonna see a big expansion, $50 million to Hilo Hospital to improve it, I think 18 to fix Kona, which was otherwise in big trouble. And I may have a slide up here uh, to talk about our hospital, but it was a substantial, a substantial investment. Does anyone remember offhand, it was $20 million or something like that, yeah. So it's gonna be a really big improvement just so we have a good facility to work in so we can stay here on our island rather than having to go and transfer. Because people don't really want that, especially if it's young people, because we want them to be near their aunties or uncles or their parents so that they can have visitors, so they can recover properly and really live their lives. So once again, big investments that way. The other things we're doing, and I think it was mentioned earlier, was improving Medicaid reimbursements. This is important because a lot of people end up distinguishing and discriminating, like, oh, this person's on Medicaid, so I'm just gonna see the private pay or I'll see the Medicare maybe patient. But we wanna make it equal, same. So we put in over 30 million bucks. It comes with more than a dollar for dollar match from the federal government, so that really creates a lot of money. That means we end up with $73 million extra, 
for Medicaid. And so we're hopeful that all Medicaid providers then will not have to struggle or not struggle as much. I also think that it's just an equality thing because before the pandemic, about eight to 10 years ago, we were at a place where 252,000 of our people are on Medicaid out of 1.4 million, so that's one out of six. We reached 465,000 of our citizens on Medicaid by the end of the pandemic. That was one out of three. So you get the idea. That means that all of us who are in healthcare, social services, much more difficult to provide the care for them. So we're fixing all these things, and these repairs probably do more to help our children than anyone else, because all of the kids were falling into that category if they had any poverty whatsoever. And then, unacceptable to not have pediatricians in good care and good prevention. Okay. So the next thing is creating a totally different approach to how we view people struggling, and that's the Office of Wellness, Wellness and Resilience. And you're gonna hear a lot more of this from Tia, who's right here. Yes, Tia is our leader here, she's fantastic. Her office is fully staffed already. The Senate was really smart in the House, and special thanks to guys, even though I fight with them sometimes, um, but like uh, Chair Delacruz, it's really instrumental. We fight on other stuff, but this was great. This was great work. And I appreciate this because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure people understand that people's early life struggles really will impact what goes on with the rest of their life. So getting and supporting people's lives, getting to them when they're age one, one two, three, four, before they're already struggling in middle school or have severe depression or senses of isolation or anxiety is the right thing to do. This is a little bit additionally important to me, I'll tell you a small vignette. I was wrestling with, um, with development early on, so I didn't speak until almost age two. And they thought I had, at the time it was referred to as um, mental retardation, right? Intellectual disability. I was deaf, actually. And had I not had early interventions and my parents had not been able to get me to a provider that could figure it out, I would have been put into an institution. You know, I would have ended up much more like Augie T. And so, so this means that I was able to, you know, do a little bit better in life. So, um, so I really appreciate early intervention beyond what anybody could imagine. So you're gonna hear a lot about this, but mostly our focus is to work on health disparities, this early trauma, and use trauma-informed care in what we do. And we don't know where the end of this rainbow ends, but we do know it's better. Better than all of the other approaches that people take, which is just waiting till later when people are suffering. And we have the resources now, so we're doing it. We're just gonna do it in real time. Other things you're gonna see and hear from Tia have to do with us being a trauma-informed state and going to all of our departments, even the other departments that aren't even healthcare or human services related, and showing them that when there are people who have been traumatized, it's harder for them to get into housing, it's harder for them to get into jobs. So we can do a lot to actually support them in a different kind of way. So we're doing that. Here's our health healthcare infrastructure, and I actually do have the number, number here. It was. Um, 21.2 million for Samuel Mahilona Hospital, and an additional 30 million, 39 million dollars for Maui Health System for repairs. So that when we really fix up our infrastructure, our healthcare infrastructure, it's easier for us to track people or keep our own kids here working in healthcare. Because if I'm going to be blunt, we do compete in our discipline, and it's a great competition with people going into hospitality, which is super important. But all of our people need healthcare, so. I want us to have a very good hospitality system and I need us to have a totally supported health and human services system. And if we do those things, we're gonna be, we're already basically the best state, but we're gonna be even better. We're already the number one health state, which is an amazing thing because great people like Ron and others have helped, kept us health insured, they've kept us um, getting access to prevention more than all the other states. So can you imagine, we're number one and you guys all know what our poopers are in our own system. So, big deal. But these are our investments. Now, this is the next part that I really want to share with you, because I view, and I want to be very direct about this, I view housing as healthcare, period. I, and I'm not even drawing a distinction like it's a social determinant of health or any of that. It is actually healthcare, and I'm going to explain how I know that. That's a picture of a really great person named Marsha Fudge. She, she's the HUD secretary, so the, the number one person in the country. She used to be a congresswoman on housing. She's going to be in here to visit us on 4th of July weekend, so 
could get her drunk and get her to appropriate money for our state. Now, the things we're doing right now are we're working best we can to get rid of red tape. This is the one part where even if we're really kind of in lockstep and mind meld on issues, I, I want to prepare you that I'm probably going to cut back on some red tape. We're not going to make negative decisions on environmental concerns or conservation, but I really do want to slash some of the red tape that's gone into the housing process because in general, in general, we just need a lot more units for our people. And I know that in every community it can become contentious because, you know, we love the way we live and we're worried about what change will bring, but it's affecting all of us now. So expect an emergency proclamation on housing somewhere, somewhere around the third week of June. Now, just so you know, we've already done our emergency proclamation on homelessness. It didn't affect anybody negatively. In fact, all it's doing is opening up Cal Holly really fast. And it's been like zero negatives from it. We're getting homeless guys with chronic disease off the streets. One guy called me on my cell phone at 10 o'clock at night, told me I had nine strokes. And I'm gonna go back into Queens again several times. Can you just give me one of the cow holly and put him in there? And now he's fine. He's getting health care around the clock. His cost is like maybe 100 bucks a day as opposed to 5,000 bucks a day. And he's just doing better. You know, he will be able to reconnect to his family. Will he be healthy forever? No, of course have issues, but he's not going to have issues day after day after day. One individual spent $1.2 million a couple years ago just because he went to the hospital 241 times. When we could have given him a roof over his head, he was homeless, and the cost usually dropped 70 to 75 percent, 73 percent was the study we did. So that's what we're doing. Now we're going to build these units um, come hell or high water best we possibly can and really create, if we if we have any chance to be some surplus of housing, it's affordable to the best of our ability all across the state. So prepare for that. We're gonna hopefully make it like a tsunami of housing. It's not easy. That's the hardest thing we'll do because it takes a lot of process. But again, please bear with me if we do some Cowhale or a couple of housing projects to just get it going. Okay. There's what Cowhale is. Now, we've already built several of them. That's my chief of staff, Brooke posing at the side of that Kauhale there, me talking to her. And this one's a medical respite Kauhale, right across from Queens Hospital. Right, my, right, my house is like right there, and Queens is right there. So this is in my backyard for real. And what this does is if someone comes out of the hospital, and the hospitals are all calling us, they say, this guy's homeless, this woman's homeless, could you take him or her and just watch over them until they get over their staph infection or their diabetic surgery or whatever? And already full, immediately. So soon we'll be adding more and more and more. We're gonna do a big one on Middle Street. We'd love to do a couple on Kauai, on Maui. Big Island's gonna do one that's gonna be, this one's gonna be incredible. It's gonna be specifically for people who are recovering from addiction. So a recovery cow holiday. We're gonna do one just for Kukuna because there's a lot more people who are now elderly. In fact, the average age is, is over 60 at this particular cow holiday. Because they have an illness, they go in there. So the, what's the deal? Um, again, if a person is homeless or without a roof over their head, it's a health condition. They, instead of living to be 83, like all my uh, Japanese uh, aunties and uncles on Jamie's side, you know, they're doing well, you drop three decades. You live to 53 if you don't have a home. So three decades of life come out of you, and of course, all the suffering that happens. It's worse than like the worst cancers. Pancreatic cancer doesn't even take that many years off somebody's life on average, okay? So we do that. So we have the respite, and we will build over time, it's going to be 12 to 20 of these in the first you know, four years that I have to serve. And I'll serve more if, I, if I'm allowed, but that's the first four years to do this. Now, that combined with respite, that's the H4 program, which is a hygiene center, the next floor is healthcare, third floor is housing, and fourth, fourth floor is permanent housing, third floor being medical housing. That kind of thing in different parts can be deconstructed how you want, really, really, takes the sting out of that. And you know, you guys know, because we are all on the human services budget, which is about $4 billion for the whole state. Of that, about 3.5% of our people who struggle the most consume about 60% of that budget. So imagine what that means. 60% of that $4 billion is $2.4 $2 billion consumed by just, you know, 3.5% of the people who are wrestling. That ends up averaging over 80 grand per person per year. So how many of you have clients that end up getting $80,000 of services per year? 
not very many, but a lot of them need more service unless you happen to be in this space, working with homeless individuals who are struggling with health problems and mental illness and so on. So the goal is decrease their cost, make their suffering go down through our harm reduction and increase our investment in all the other things that we need. And that's how the situation gets better. The Cal Holly projects will be, like I say, peppered throughout the state. The legislature was very cool about this. They gave 15 million for this first year and 33 million for the second year to build these things. I'm gonna tell you a little secret. This first one cost basically nothing because so many people love the idea. They just made like $100,000 donation, $50,000 donation, $100,000 donation. It was amazing. Now the services will cost. So that's where our cost will be, which is the, is the jobs for like us, the royal we here, right? These are the jobs, that, amongst other jobs and disciplines, people will be asked to consult on, or their company will be asked to come and be a part of it. So this is kind of a part of the future, but it's not just a small part because of the total consumption of resource. And that's why I wanted to really make a, a statement about this. A few other things that we're going to talk about. We did get a lot of run, uh, monies to run with for the housing refu uh, revolving fund, dwelling units, housing first, rapid rehousing, all these issues. Uh, rent supplements just because people are struggling. So if we can share these slides with you just so you know, the number one focus for me is to, as governors to deal with people who are struggling. Number one. The next focus is to deal with the housing crisis which ripples into all of the rest of us and how we are all struggling paying most of our money towards rent if we're not lucky enough to own a house from generations past. So those are our top priorities. And there's a million other great things, but a lot of it folds into the harm reduction in the health space and in the housing space. We could talk a lot about climate, we could talk, which is super duper important. We could talk about some of the health, pol uh, health policy and public policy like gun laws and that kind of thing. But really this is where my heart is. Now there's another picture of the Cal Holly Mall. This is me getting yelled at in uh, Waimanawa. I'm in the back there. But after a couple hours, people started to get it. I shared just what I'm sharing with you right now. Now there's a vibrant Cal Holly there where 60 or 70 people live, totally peaceful. A lot of those guys had some issues with drugs. They don't now because they're getting care, because they're getting food, they have shelter. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn close. Almost 90% of the people stay and then stay forever. Others find a place to then get reunited with their kids or their parents, they can get back into a house once they're no longer dealing with methamphetamine or whatever. Or they get back on their meds. Or maybe they're just really old and they just need some love. I mean, these are the things that are going on. So that's a Cal Holly. Uh, a typical one would cost up to $5 million to build, but everyone's always, like I said, giving me all the resources. So costs come way down, which means we can spend the money instead on services, which is really what I believe is going to happen, and I've already talked to the HUD secretary and the president, and I'm going to spend more time with President Biden and whoever else serves in these coming years to do what I'm going to propose a six state pilot, three um, red states, three blue states, one big one, one little one, one medium one will be the little one, okay? To do this and to spend resources and get extra federal resources from Medicaid Match to do this because we get the, the return on investment. It's not about money, except that we want the money then for other stuff. It's like 400%. For every dollar we spend, we get like at least $4 back to save, to spend on any other idea you can come up with. So I'm gonna push as governor for this kind of stuff. Now, as I come down the home stretch, and I like can answer any question you like, this is like my brain on healthcare. This is how I actually view the healthcare system. We can say social determinants of health. In some conversations, we can say healthcare for all. But when someone asks me what I actually think about America's healthcare system through the lens of Hawaii, which again is better than any other healthcare system, I look at it like this. So it's social health, which is on one hand, it's access to healthcare. That's like our loan forgiveness, getting doctors, nurses, uh, social workers, everybody into the system. Housing and food security. They don't have housing and food security. They're, you know, they just can't survive. There's no way, or they're gonna live three decades less. On the left is wages and economics, and some kind of living wage, like a real living wage, actually enough money to pay for housing, pay for your kids, everything else, you know, is gravy, but just that. And if we do that, which is why it was mentioned about doing the tax breaks, 
we got phase one, which is 125 million. Phase two is gonna really enhance the tax credits in a big way for childcare and adult daycare, up to five grand per person that's in that. So if you have two little kids and they're in that circumstance, or one little kid and a, and a tutu, you could get 10 grand back straight up to that family. And that's probably enough to pay for additional services or give you the flexibility to go do that extra job or whatever you need. That's why that's so important. So, and everything in the middle, Alice families, housing first, school lunch, food insecurity, hospice, very important in my opinion, very important service. Universal preschool, which Sylvia is gonna kick butt on, loan forgiveness, minimum wage reform, dealing with sex trafficking, it's a big deal, it's no joke. All these things, if we look at healthcare, and I can only fit so much stuff in there, but that's really what healthcare is like. And you notice I don't talk a lot about hospitals and surgeries, I talk more about social health. Because 95% of healthcare, and I, this is what I feel and, and experienced, certainly in our state, is that. The other 5% sure. You know, somebody gives you chlamydia, it's a bummer. But this is really what healthcare is, okay? Don't put that on. I see you. Okay. Um, so this is where we are. It's not just a beautiful place, although it is beautiful. Okay. It is going to be bold, so we're not messing around. We're going to do this stuff now. Like that's why this first six months was important to get some of this locked in, and now we're going full tilt, like 150 miles an hour. Um, it's innovative because we have actual experience and I've been able to listen to you and you and you over these years as a family doc. It was actually pretty easy for me to actually hear people because I wasn't too trapped in the legislature, not so much. And then finally, just be compassionate and all those other issues fall into place. And I know it was nice enough to share time on Hokulea. Hokulea is like the best symbol we have about bravery, courage, which is how we would like to govern, at least uh, symbolically. So that's why I put that. And that's me and Jamie, just say mahalo because we care about you guys. I'll stop there. I, I know I went a little bit over. Is it okay for me to take a couple questions if anybody has them? I would. You guys, can, you guys want to do questions? Can you imagine if Governor Egan said, Chlamydia? <laughs> so, guys, we had a mental health conference, okay? So I'll let you guys know. You talk about trauma right here. If you wonder why I was successful for 30 years making people laugh, he can say a lot of stuff that I was taught growing up was just out of this world. So now doing public service, it balances, right, Governor? You need that side in your life. If not, hard to like sit there and just listen to people talk repetitive, 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 repetitive. So, ladies and gentlemen, come on, Governor Josh Green. So let's take some questions. Anybody? Okay, question right there. Come on, brother. Hi, good morning, Governor. Uh, I just want to ask, there was a, a recent request from community members about uh, housing development in, I think it's Wailua. And um, there was some request that the state maybe consider purchasing, and I'm wondering if you can just comment on the feasibility or viability of uh, a request like that. Yes, that's great. No, that's great. So the answer is yes. We will abs I, immediately after getting the request and watching the um, the town hall talk story, right? Saw that this is an opportunity. Now I didn't know what the whole politics were. People loving the the project or not, but I have asked. Holly Watson, who's our DHHL director, who has $600 million. I've asked him to aggressively, wherever it's possible, to purchase properties with Nani, who's our housing lead, and put them into the community. Now, I always, just in fairness, I do want to get a little bit of input from the people that you guys picked in for council seats, mayors, and stuff like that, because I don't want to wade in and do the opposite of what people would want. But that is something. If you guys want us to buy that and keep people in housing and to also put more things into the inventory for our Hawaiian community, it's very good. And it doesn't have to be DHHL. There's other pockets of money like that one slide showed because it's difficult to build housing from the ground up, honestly, and it costs a lot, as we all know, and a lot of time. It costs at least $350,000 per unit. So anytime there is a property 
that is in good shape but just needs a little love, that's fantastic. Perfect, because we can go and put that into our, you know, kind of our housing inventory. Or if there's a property that needs a lot of help but the structure is solid enough, they could become like micro units. Those ones I really, really like because the new generation may not want a 1,300 or 1,500 square foot single family house. They might want a small unit so that they're not housing insecure, but also that the cost is like way lower, way lower. I also want to do a low impact housing in places that the communities accept, but only costs you know, a lot less to do like ag housing or teacher housing in communities where people can get together. And it can actually be done, it's easiest to do at DHHL because there's like no rules, okay? Very little rules on the properties that are already set up. Everywhere else more rules and then I have to figure out ways to like bend them a little bit. But to your question, you guys should tell us, if you really want us to buy it, I'll tell the guys to buy it. That's kind of the way we go. Money's not infinite, but there is a generous circumstance, and we do happen to have, I'm really super fond of Senate President. He's always been good to me, and he's been always generous to find money for projects for here at home on, on Kauai. So, you know, he will guide me more. We already had one conversation. Okay, Governor, back here. Hello, my name is Kate. I'm a nursing professor here at KCC, and on the subject of loan repayment, I am curious if that extends to graduate degrees for those of us who maybe recently, during the pandemic, decided to go back to school to become a professor. Um, we can only admit so many nursing students based on our number of professors, and I took a 30% pay cut to become a nursing professor. Um, and so I'm just curious if that extends to those graduate degrees. Thank you for that. I, for now, and we're, we're finalizing all the details. So the answer is likely yes, because we're gonna have so many of these spots that the, the goal is to have people at least doing some clinical. So what my personal recommendation would be, describe some clinical responsibilities, whether it's as a um, extern leader or a, uh, a teacher in the field at a clinic or something like that to make sure that the people that you're working with directly are also getting some health care. That's the general approach. We don't want to cut people out or the educators because we need the extra educators to train the group of individuals. What's more likely is we're going to create extra bonuses and retention for people that are teachers at the system. So that might be the other way that we do this because we're putting a fair amount of appropriation into directly the programs, the training programs themselves. But don't hesitate and you guys should, you can get me on my I'll give you two emails that are the easy ones. The one that's super easy is josh.green at hawaii.gov, okay? My personal email, which I check all day long, is my whole name. It's Joshua Booth Green at yahoo.com. My parents were crazy enough to name me after the guy who shot Lincoln. So it's Joshua Booth Green at yahoo.com, and that comes straight to me. And then I can, in those conversations, try to do that. I, what I'm asking people to do is, like at different organizations, like maybe you're an organization right now that needs to hire 10 social workers and five uh, addiction specialists. I want you to say, I would like to lock in 15 of these loan uh, repayment grants and we'll do it, we'll hire them because we're gonna need infrastructure to hire these things and then you guys can be doing it. Um, I would just finally say, err on the side of making sure that you're delivering care to your community and since I'm making the rules on this, I'm going to be very flexible, as long as it's going back into the community. Awesome. Okay. I see hands. Uh, the governor has till 12 o'clock, so don't worry. <laughs> You're so funny, governor. <laughs> we got like 10 minutes. Oh, five. Five minutes. You know funny? My middle name is John Wilkes. Yeah, I do. John I'll Wilkes. give John Wilkes tea. John Wilkes Booth's nephew <laughs> from the house I was born okay. in. Okay. That's a true story. Terrible. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Green. Um, I just have a question, but it doesn't sound like exactly um, on point for this, but it kind of under, underscores some of the needs that fold into mental health. When people are in transition, is there, um, is there something in place to, to create education for self-care, or care for the environment, or care for animals that they own? Because when we have had folks in these situations, they're houseless, they don't have those skills and that concerns people in the community and resistance, and I wonder if there's something in place to teach self-care and to monitor that. 
thank you for that. In, in fact, the answer is yes, and much of what Tia is going to talk about in her, pre the, in her presentation, which follows mine right now, is about that. It's about resilience, it's about self-care, it's about trauma reduction, and it's about the new services that we're going to connect people to. So the answer is yes. In fact, so much so that we created a whole department to do it. Yes. OK, we've got two more questions, because I know you got to leave. So question here. You've been talking a lot, everybody's been talking a lot about all of the needs that we have on, in Hawaii. And one of the things that, that has been bothering me is Kaha City. I don't remember the whole long name of it, yeah. but, but it's been in the bills in the legislature. It, they put it down, they killed it, and it keeps rising again. Yeah. And you're the last. Yeah, I'm vetoing that. And, yes. and I, I hope you're listening to what people have been saying is that we need all these other things. We don't need that. Yes. Yeah, so um, what that nice lady is talking about is uh, this tech park and creating a centralized law enforcement space. Now, we need some support for like HIEMA and emergency management and so on. But that project, and I'm not imputing anybody, will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay? So I'm not doing it. So I'm going to announce that uh, we're just not going to do that one this time through. Because, really to your point and to all of our interests, I'd rather be spending money, and I'm appreciative to the very same people that had that idea, which I don't like as much. They were generous and gave us the loan forgiveness money. They were generous and gave us the, the homeless support money and all the health care reimbursements. Those are better things to do. And I would rather have five years of tax credits for Alice families to get them up off their, you know, up off their backs and into, into life than to commit to the tech park. And we will find ways to improve our facilities. But uh, you will hear this, I'm not trying to make news today because we're talking about healthcare and human services, but I am going to restrict uh, $1.1 billion of spending over the next two years of stuff that was just a little bit beyond what's cool, okay? So we're gonna continue to invest fully in housing, human services, healthcare, and we're gonna pause on projects which look a little bit like, you know, come on, what are we doing here, all right? So that's how we're gonna do it. Uh, and we have to get some of the other big projects done. You know, I know people have been very focused on the rail for a long time. They're making progress on that. Honestly, I voted against it because I was worried. I wanted that $10 billion ultimately go to schools and hospitals. But now that we've learned that lesson, there you go. So we're gonna do something different. And we have to deal with people recovering, we have to deal a little bit with incarceration questions because it's tough out there and some people need to get off the drugs and such and get better. So that's where the focus is gonna be. But sometime later this next week, I'll make those announcements on what cuts are happening and that's why. Awesome, okay, one more question. You get the lucky last question. Absolutely. It, it will go to, again, anyone who is providing care in a space of need, and we're going to make that really straightforward. So let's say you work for, what's your example? What? I work for Carolina Behavioral Health. Okay, great. So you work for a behavioral health company, they may not be a nonprofit, but maybe you don't have enough money to pay back your loans, you owe $75,000 of loans. So we're going to basically support. It's going to be, in some cases, $50,000 per person per year. In other cases, $25,000. Um, alternatively, we may give an option just to sweep it all clear in four years, as long as you continue to provide care for our population of people. And it won't really be hard to meet the need of 20% Medicaid, because I think I'm going to grandfather in all of the neighbor islands, and then only be a little bit um, inquisitive about the most rich areas on Oahu, where they have tend to have a lot more providers. So yes, you will qualify. People will need to know that they have to commit themselves, and this should not be difficult for you or others, to four years staying in the state, because I don't want people to just kind of buzz in, get their cash, and go. But the goal is to provide care for everyone. And then we'll see where we are in a couple of years. We'll see if we made big 
improvements. Hopefully it'll be really transformational when all of our people have access to care more quickly. I think our largest challenge is going to be to find enough people to work in healthcare and human services and outreach because historically we just don't have enough people. Um, but I will ask you humbly to reach back out to the people you trained who went to other states. Make sure your kids or your grandkids know that this is an option to come home. Maybe that's the Maybe that's the barrier they get over so they can afford a house. Maybe that's the barrier they get, they get over so they can afford to have their child um, at age 30 instead of waiting another eight years because they don't have savings. These are the things we want to do for our people. And I was really grateful that they funded that program. And just, look, one last thing. Thank you very much. Thank you for including me. You are an awesome epicenter of healthcare for this island. Spread the word. Anything except for the chlamydia comment, <laughs> which I, which I, which Augie owes me fifty dollars because he said I couldn't get the word chlamydia three times into my talk, and I did now. So that's you, fifty bucks. Um, except for that, share these ideas and also help me to improve them. But we're gonna we're gonna be um, pretty energetic about getting them into our state real fast. Thank you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Josh Green. Okay, so here's what we want to do. We want to do a group picture. So if I, yeah, I don't know, how, how do you want to do it? Oh, just, oh, okay, all right. Yeah, okay, we'll take a quick picture. And while that's happening, uh, we got some giveaways. How's that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Just think of the full council members, Kuali and Cavalio back there. Yes. Once again, Governor Josh Green, everybody. I do have some giveaways. Uh, this is for a weekend stay at Motel Lani. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you said Motel. <laughs> oh, you guys went, oh, wait, wait, what? What? Oh, beautiful staycation. Yeah. Okay, now I got actually I got I got some nice swag and by the way you guys please go check out the vendors. Uh, let's see. First two people that can show me your library card. Come on. Why are you laughing? I know we live in a different time, but first two people that can show me like oh wait, hold on, hold on. Okay, first he's okay. There you go. Congratulations. I'll give you something. You, I'll, I'll give you, uh, how nice is that? Wait, hold on, I'm gonna get you some. I'm gonna get you the Maui Lani, uh, Hotel Lani weekend. Let's see. Oh, okay, all right, here. Swag, yes, sir. I mean, you, you get them in your wallet. That's so fun. People still get their library card. You remember how hard it was? We had to. We actually had to go to the library, look through stuff. Oh, and if you was in one class and everybody wanted one certain book, you was like, oh, I can't find them. Like, all right, you guys ready for our next speaker? Okay, great. Uh, in 2021, Ms. Hotstock was named the chair of the Act 209 Statewide Trauma Informed Care Task Force and has been a part of a a local and national effort to address the representation of Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders in Hawaii, the system of care. In July 2022, in partnership with the National Vera Institute of Justice, Hawaii achieved zero girls incarcerated and received national attention for this accomplishment. In December 2022, she was appointed by Governor Green as the executive director of the newly established Office of Wellness and Resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Tia Hartstock. Uh, aloha, everyone. Uh, it's, I'm, it's really fun to go after the governor and uh, talk in front of your own boss. So uh, they're about to leave, so this I'll just pause for a few minutes and wait for him to leave. Okay. 
Um, thanks for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about wellness and resilience and the new office that we have. Uh, I, first of all, mahalo to Alice folks, um, of course our amazing MC, uh, and to uh, you folks here in Kauai who have done such an amazing job building a community uh, around resilience. The Resilience Project from years and years ago is is still gathering data and it's something that has been informing the country for years. Um, mahalo to uh, the other guest speakers here today and uh, I, I wanted to send a special shout out to Dr. He, who, <laughs> who is an amazing child psychologist and advocate here in Kauai and I'm just so happy to be here with her. Um, this office was created specifically to look at addressing the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 uh, intention, the impacts of COVID-19 on the community here. What we're looking at, if you want to go back one more slide, what we're looking at is, as Governor Green mentioned, this office was established in Session Laws 2022. And I, I got appointed in December of 2022 and started in January. And since January, we've been able to fully staff as of last week. So I have six folks across the state uh, staffing this office. Thank you. <laughs> if any of you work in the state, you realize how difficult it is not only to find people right now, uh, but to establish positions and hire in. So to be able to do that in four months, we've just been so thrilled. Um, we have six staff across the state. I have one in Hilo, one in Maui, uh, one on Oahu, uh, and those three policy planner type of folks will be focusing on uh, program development, trauma-informed care and policies, legislative policy, looking at trauma-informed programs, and helping in, uh, organizations across the state to address uh, the, the impacts of the pandemic, as well as the mental health needs that were uh, abundant before the pandemic began. Our, we will be covering, of course, um, every island in terms of uh, support for organizations and departments. But that's just how the staff applicants fell, and it's just such an amazing opportunity to be able to house folks. At all I got for the last four months was, please don't make this Oahu-centric. Please do not make this Oahu-centric. So to have the staff fall uh, on neighbor islands and the skill sets to be um, embedded uh, and the presence to be there. Uh, I'm just super proud of that. I'm gonna start with just, I, I like stories. I like the illustration of stories. And I just wanna start with uh, a concept that's quite close to me in terms of resilience. Um, Right before the internment uh, on the continent of uh, Japanese Americans occurred, uh, there was a contingency that went to Washington DC to make a, a plea to uh, the president, met with the first lady and plead with her, pled with her to say, please, please think about convincing your husband. There was a huge effort. Um, Although that didn't help, uh, it did turn her heart and very much pushed her in an area of advocating for uh, building resilience within uh, different communities across the country. I'm so proud to say that the gentleman right in the middle is my grandfather. And his ability to, <laughs> his ability to advocate and be an activist in this area to, to look at the rights and look at the ability for communities to not be disproportionately targeted and, and disproportionately represented in areas that are overwhelmingly um, in, not in support. And what, what my whole career has been really looking at is the disproportionate representation of indigenous folks, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, in our systems, looking at the criminal justice system, looking at the child welfare system, looking at the mental health system, and really trying to pay attention to what our systems are doing and how our systems are disproportionately targeting and disproportionately uh, impacted uh, by uh, criminal, criminal laws that, and, and different types of mental health needs 
that need to be addressed as a system, that need to be addressed within our communities, and that really need to be addressed on a grassroots level so that it, it isn't, and I've said this several times, it isn't the state's kuleana, the, it is not just the state's responsibility to, to look at this in our communities, it's all of us. And I, I'm, not a, I'm not a politician, I never have been. I've worked in nonprofits and been in the different departments for several years. Um, but the advocacy and the activism lives very, very strong in me. Uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge my uh, grandfather and his work. I never got to meet him. Uh, but uh, he, and right after this happened, right after that meeting happened, uh, he got interned. Uh, my aunt my, and my mother were born into the internment camp and, uh, in Tule Lake, California and spent several years there. So it was something that has been a legacy of our family that we've been, we have been um, activated and look at looking, have been looking at the advocacy of people who are disproportionately impacted by trauma. How many of you know how to do Slido? I, I think it's active right now. So I know you all have your phones very close. <laughs> so bust out your phones. And if you can zoom in on this, if not, go to, on this QR code, if not, go to slido.com and enter 1790192. And I want to do audience participation in this because I really want to get feedback from you folks and you'll see it pop up on your phone, the feedback immediately. But I wanted to ask questions because I know that there's some students here. Where are the students and early career folks in the room? Okay, so if you look at this question, I want to see what careers you currently are in and or working toward. What are the areas of interest that you folks have? And my assumption is, is, is it's healthcare, mental health, but I, I, I just want to make sure that we um, provide voice to this audience. And the second piece of that is, and it's going to create a word cloud that will pop up on your phone of all the answers that folks are typing in. The other part to that is, what does trauma-informed care mean to you? And if somebody could look on their word, is it working? If you can work, work, look on your word cloud and start to yell out some things that are coming up uh, from, your, from the audience. Social work. Psychology, public health, public health. Mindfulness. mindfulness, what was that? Clinical social, work. clinical social work. Where's the clinical social workers? <laughs> what else? Easter seals. Easter seals, a lot of community organizations, a lot of community interest. And how does this, in terms of career movement, and in terms of getting into what Governor Green was just talking about, um, moving towards that workforce recruitment, workforce retention, and really thinking about what we need to do as a state to better recruit people coming into this state, to come into healthcare, to come into mental health, because the behavioral health needs that we are seeing are intense. And they're not only intensifying as the months go by, they were already intense before the pandemic happened. And as many of you know, if you are in this field, our ability to recruit and retain people in this field seems to be more and more and more difficult as the days go by. Does that resonate with anybody in this room? Anybody feeling that in your organization? How many of you are fully staffed? <laughs> How many of you are fully staffed here? Couple, what's the secret, Erin? <laughs> a small organization with a great mission, right? What else? There's only one other person that raised their hand. <laughs> yes. Okay. So how, when we're looking at an entire state? How many people are, are flocking to your doors looking to become a state employee? Zero, I said zero. 
It's not a lot, so what are we doing and what are we going to do as a state? And one of the things that this office is looking at is building that ability within our state, creating a mechanism and mechanisms to get people interested and retain good knowledge. And here's the other piece that is such a huge concern, is retaining local knowledge here. How do we, how do we attract youth coming out of high school, coming out of their AA, coming out of their bachelor's, coming out of their master's, coming out of their PhD programs and their society programs. How do we attract them enough to keep them here so that they are a part of their community and giving back to their community? That is one of the biggest things that we are, are so interested in doing as an organization and as an office. And I wanted to see if you folks could also start to put in, and it's gonna be in the same word cloud, what does trauma-informed care mean to you? How many of you want to just yell it out? It might be a new concept to some, and I'll go over it in a little bit. But please, in that same slide, I'll go ahead and, and put some words in there as what that means. When we think about the focus, as I mentioned, of the community, uh, of strengthening our communities. Now we're first thinking about saying, um, this is what the Office of Wellness and Resilience is gonna be focusing on. We're gonna be focusing on strengthening our systems. But you know what? The systems are, are set up and in some way, shape, or form, they are succeeding at what they're doing. But there are so much, so much improvement that we need to make. We always hear folks um, from the state, and I'm in the state, I have been with the state, say, we're doing a great job. And, and we are in some respects, but guess what? We can do so much better. And this is something that is, is hopefully going to help from many facets, this multi-faceted approach, not just we're in the state, we've got this piece, but really trying to look at partnering with our community nonprofits partnering with our grassroots organizations and really reaching out to organizations um, and agencies that aren't really at the table. One of the things that is gonna be a critical piece to look at is are these three areas that we're focusing on. The first one is, is of course, training and technical assistance. Now we're looking at specifically trauma-informed care and how do we help train folks up to understand what it means to approach people and respond to people that have traumatic experiences, that have childhood trauma, that have adverse childhood experiences, what we call the ACEs. And when those experiences happen, it changes the way that we think about the world around us. It changes the way that we interact with folks. And it changes our ability to remember, to learn, to concentrate. And so training people in our systems and our programs and communities around what trauma is and what trauma does and how do we build resilience in order to, to counterbalance and counteract. Can we stop the trauma from happening? I mean, that would be a great goal. But one of the things that we really wanna pay attention to is not re-traumatizing people when they're in our systems and understanding what behaviors we do that trigger others. Because every one of you sitting here has seen that, right? We may have done it. I remember working at Catholic Charities 25 years ago, and some of the things that we did, I worked in the adjudicated sex offender home. Some of the things that we did with those kids with programming probably triggered them. Well, I shouldn't say probably, definitely triggered them because they would have dis behaviors that were elevating and we were sitting there with a notepad saying, oh yeah, you want to say that word to me? Negative 200 points. Are you going to keep going? Another negative 200 points. Oh really? Okay, two more hundred points taken off of your daily building uh, uh, around whether or not you can watch TV or not and you're just sitting there triggering them as they're calmly, as they're screaming at you and you're going, oh yeah, you're gonna scream at me more? That's another 200, keep going. And those kind of behaviors were really triggering to kids. That was the system we had in place. How many of you remember doing point systems that just sat there and did that with kids? We didn't know any better. 
This was in the 90s, so some of you might not have been alive in the 90s. Uh, but that's what we used to do. So we knew, <laughs> so we knew our systems were not the best. And we know our systems are not the best now, so there's always room for improvement. And that's something that we're really looking at assisting the state and assisting our systems with, is how do we get better at approaching and responding to people who have trauma histories? And by the way, it's not those families over there, it's all of us. So not only is this for those whom we serve, this is for us. As Governor just mentioned, the COVID pandemic has had an intense impact on our workforce, our communities, our kupuna, our keihi. And it's impacted the way that we show up at work, and that impacts the way in which we go home, walk through that front door, and engage with our families. Because for a lot of us working in the healthcare field, mental health field, okay, we can relax and go home and just kind of try and recover from a stressful day. But when we're going home to an environment that is also stressful and unpredictable and scary and full of fear, and we don't know what's gonna happen next during the pandemic, it's been a three year period where the, the release and exhale has been a little bit more challenging. So trauma-informed care approaches are not just for those that we serve. They're really for addressing how we balance ourselves, how we regulate ourselves, how we take care of ourselves. And I'll be talking about self-care a little bit uh, as, a, as an organization, as a community. This is, this is what we're talking about, is, is the resilience of a workforce. If we cannot show up fully present, balanced, how are we supposed to role model that to anyone else? How many of you here, if not today, but over the last three years, can relate to the word burnout? Only six, that's amazing. <laughs> you guys are so, it's Kauaia, of course. You have the most beautiful place in the state that you live. Really? How many, let me ask one more time. How many of you felt what burnout means in the last three years? Okay, there we go, thank you. People are a little shy. I can, I can define it too. Um, how about compassion fatigue? And I'll define it. If you don't know what that means, compassion fatigue. So I see Maya's just like, oh yeah. We know what compassion fatigue is. So do I, girl. <laughs> and what about vicarious trauma? And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is something that is so critical to the workforce because if we are burnt out, have no compassion, and are getting traumatized vicariously from the stories that we hear day in and day out, and we take it home, what does that leave our communities looking at like? And I'll tell you, it's not a question of if it's gonna happen to you. It is a question of when and how intensely it's going to happen. Because nobody's getting out of this field without having an impact of what these stories do to us and what it triggers in us from our own experiences and what it triggers from what we know about our parents and our grandparents and what it's teaching our keiki and our own children. So what this looks like is really trying to pay attention, validate, and take away the shame. There's no shame in being fatigued or burnt out or having vicarious trauma impact us. Taking away that stigma is such a huge necessity and, and not feeling like we can't talk about it because that means you're not passionate, dedicated enough, strong enough, professional. Because guess what? That's, that is absolutely not what it means. It means you're human and you empathize. Because only with empathy is how we build connection. 
And when we are open to that connection through being an empathetic listener, to being an empathetic provider, to be an empathetic coworker, an empathetic supervisor, when we are empathetic, it really opens us up because we're connecting with their emotion, it opens us up to be vicariously traumatized. So if you're empathetic, you're going to have the impact and the concepts of what it means to, to understand vicariously what it means to be traumatized, if not our own primary trauma. Because if you've lived this long, you understand what trauma is. You know what grief and loss feels like. You know what it, me it feels to be uh, scared and fearful around not knowing what's coming next. Through the pandemic has taught us more than anything is we had no idea what hap was going to happen next, and the anxiety of that just magnified. The last thing I'm going to talk about, uh, the last um, piece that the office is going to address is what I've mentioned before, and I'm going to really look at um, defining this for folks of you who this might be new to. Trauma-informed care is really this kind of overarching framework of addressing people and responding to people and ourselves instead of saying, God, what is wrong with you people? Why can't you sit still in class? What's wrong with you, kid? Stop bouncing off the, stop bugging that person. Stop making trouble in class and really thinking in, in a different way and say, oh my gosh, I wonder what happened, what happened this morning? What's going on today? You seem a little elevated. You seem a little hyper. You seem really irritated. You seem sad. You're getting at the same thing. What's really happening right now is they're saying, what is wrong with you? Come on. To something's going on. I wonder what that is. And so many of us are so scared to ask those questions because we open this huge box. But in reality, so much healing happens and so much connection happens when we just empathetically listen. Trauma-informed care is steeped in six principles. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is a federal agency that has defined for our states and states have chosen to adopt some of these principles in one way, shape, or form. Safety, trust and transparency, peer support, collaboration, empowerment, and cultural and historical trauma. And how do we really think about how each of those principles play out and what we do and how we engage people? When we think about the pandemic and we, when we think about our inability to predict and trust our governments to inform us what's happening and what's coming next. It depends on what news station you were listening to <laughs> or where you were getting your information or what conversations you were having or what research you did on your own. The trust and transparency was a huge deal. Our ability to create safety in our ho own homes was intense. Our ability to create safety in our schools and in our workplaces was also intense. And we're looking at all these pieces. How many of you left work and went home and debriefed with your family about your day? Oh my goodness, how, guess what I did today? Guess what I heard? And that ability to get support from somebody else or do that with your coworker, I'm a social worker by training and they always say, do not be friends with social workers if you're a social worker. <laughs> How many social workers are here? Are all your friends social workers? <laughs> Why do they say that? Because all we talk about is the crap that we've seen. And try and one up each other. Oh, that was, you wanna hear my story? Oh yeah? My, my day was so much worse. Do you want to hear this? And it's one of those things when you never really leave the work. 
We don't leave it at work. We don't leave it at home. We traumatize everyone at home. My, my husband is like, please don't talk about work. I don't need to hear those stories. I don't need you to bring that into our home. Or actually, he actually doesn't verbalize that. He just kind of looks down and plays chess on his phone, which is, that's what he's non-verbally telling me. It's just called ignoring. <laughs> but I can read his mind, and that's what he's telling me. So when we think about trauma-informed care in our systems and looking at it in the way in which we approach and respond to people, it really becomes embedding these concepts in everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis with people. Because when we're really looking at this creation of healthy communities, it has got to start with us. It has, to, we can't ask people to do anything that we're not willing to do ourselves, truly. And healthy, a healthy workforce starts with each of us individually and it just exponentially multiplies. When we, when we are balanced, when we can role model it, when we can communicate our emotional needs, when we can regulate ourselves, and when we can understand what it means to take care of ourselves, which will translate to taking care of our families, which will translate to taking care of our communities. I've gone through these concepts really quick, uh, a little bit, but when we, I, I want to focus on the self-care piece because vicarious trauma, burnout, and compassion fatigue uh, are mitigated by our ability to have organized, what I like to call organizational self-care, organizational self-care, as well as self-care. But when we say self-care, we, I, I tend to get the response of, oh, you go take care of yourself. If I'm your supervisor, oh, you look a little overwhelmed. Go take care of yourself. Go. Go do it. It's, it's, your, it's your responsibility. It's your kuleana to take care of yourself. But as a supervisor, I need to look at it as an organization, as a family, as a way to like collectively do this together. It's everyone's responsibility. Not to diffuse, the, not to diffuse it, but to think of it in a way that it's the organization's responsibility to support our ability to take care of ourselves in policies, in practice, in procedures, formally and informally. And it becomes critical in this work. And when you go to that, uh, when you go to feel this field, this what I call the helping profession, that my guess is that we are all a part of, this becomes critical. How do we decompress? How do we recognize when our glass is below the halfway full line? Everybody always uses this, the analogy of uh, put your mask on, you know, you're either, uh, in the plane, right? Put your mask on before you help your child. Why? Because if you don't have air, you can't help any, you can't help your kids. It's the same concept. If we don't have balance and if we don't have a full cup, if we don't have our own healthy soil, how do we nourish anyone else and role model that to others? This will work if I had my cell phone with me and went to the next, um, activated the next slide on slide out, <laughs> but it's down there and I'm not gonna walk down. Uh, so, my apologies for not bringing it up with me. Um, I'll, 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 I'll forward it when I get down there. But when we look at self-care, it's not going to the spa and getting pedicures and going golfing. It can be. It doesn't hurt. But what this really looks like is preventative interventions that are deliberate. How many of you go to the dentist every six months or year? How many of you do your annual doctor's visit? This is preventative health medicine. This is addressing issues before they come up. This is making sure that we are taking care of our health. What do we do for our mental health? Not every six months, not annually, but every single day. How do you folks as an organization 
as a supervisor, as supervisees, take yourselves down from 100 miles an hour, oh my God, this is the greatest day, to take a deep breath, at the end of the day, get in bed and fall asleep. What do you do to transition and take care of yourselves? Super, super important when you're in the helping profession. And how do we build organizations and communities that deliberately acknowledge and pay attention and create procedures that will allow us to do this? This is one, this is, this is one of the critical things that um, our office is gonna focus on. I think I went two minutes over. <laughs> Mahalo so much for having me here, for having Governor here with us, uh, and for welcoming us uh, to your unbelievable island. It's been several years since I've been here. I came here with my child when she was three months old and I haven't been back. She just turned eight last week. So it's been eight years since I've been back to Kuwait. Um, I'm open for questions. All right, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. Okay, I see a lot of people just staring. Anybody got questions? Okay, thank you. So, um, I would be interested in terms of building the workforce in the state. I'm an older social worker now, mostly retired. And I, when I first started moving to Hawaii, I was not able to transition my license over because I needed to have letters for my supervisors who were all dead. And I have a number of colleagues who live as Hawaiian residents. And so what we end up doing, uh, we're part-time, some of us are full-time. We do remote work to the mainland, like through the pandemic and so forth, because we could not serve people here. They had the same problem. Supervisors all dead, can't get your license switched over. So if there could be some interesting paths, like I've been uh, promoted license. to NASW yeah. and I, uh, yeah. other professional organizations, uh, so you could get an accreditation mm -hmm. from a state that meets the standards of professional organizations that <coughs> have to credential here, credential mm -hmm. here, credential here. I know we have partnerships with, I think, California um, in terms of credential, but, but license at the time too. I had a Washington State license, still current, and I had a California license. It wasn't and, acknowledged. Uh, I recently let my California license go, but it was a no. Interesting. It was a no, and maybe now it would have changed. I was taking care of sick parents at that point. I came up. But I have friends who live in the Big Island. Uh, I have other friends who came and went back to the mainland. Uh, people who were going to move out here to this island, qualified people, mm -hmm. culturally humbling people, willing to learn what you needed to bring those skills over here, train people here, and no go. Mm -hmm. Couldn't just do it. And this has been years of efforts. Uh, most of us just gave up and either can you, remote. Can you email me at this email? Uh, be, my th I see a therapist every Saturday morning at 7 a.m. She's been, she's been a psychologist in, in Wamanalo, I live in Wamanalo with my husband. She's been a psychologist in Wamanalo for 40 years. She just moved to New Hampshire, New to Vermont, somewhere. It, it all kind of looks the same to me over there. She just moved to the East Coast about nine months ago. She still is an HMSA provider, um, and I, I I'm, inter I'm interested, to, I'll look into that. I talked to a local and she has a Hawaiian license, works here as a therapist. Her client went to some other state for like she a holiday, okay. and she could not do remote work when her client sort of had to fall apart on the vacation. Mm -hmm. NASW legal consultation said she couldn't work with Interesting. that. Interesting, okay. That's nuts. It's, that is, yeah. Nuts. I do know that there's several organizations that are providing telehealth one specific to the Department of Education, because we've had such a shortage of, of licensed health, uh, mental health providers, 
there's a, a provider, I'm trying to remember the name of it, um, that's a telehealth provider that the Department of Education is utilizing right now, and they, they're actually utilizing them quite a bit uh, because of our lack of behavioral health. And the... They're sitting in our islands. Okay. Older therapists who Good to know. are doing remote work, who maybe even will be part-time, during part-time, I'm okay. Stephanie now, but you know, do little bits and pieces remote work back to the okay. mainland. I will look into that. Yeah. I'd be interested to know the answer, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you my card, actually. Okay, so I don't have to worry, because so far, I can't even see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go get the card. Okay, okay. anybody else with a question? Okay, all right. This is good. This is the most exercise I got the whole <laughs> week. All right. Hey. years to come back uh, because we really need you here. Um, the NASW has incorporated self-care into uh, the policy. Can you please incorporate that into the state and county board policy guidelines? It's, it's something that we're working on right as we speak. We're looking at how uh, we can introduce legislation around that. Thank you so much. You want to work on that with me? I'm happy to do it. Yeah, no, that's like the that's such a cool accent. What is that? New Zealand? Austria. Close, right? Don't let it. Okay, we'll take a picture. Say that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? Okay, all right. I like that guy. A lot of questions. I like that. He's a social worker. I can tell. <laughs> okay, coming to you, my friend. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I heard, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the work that I do is with children and families and uh, children that are involved with the child welfare system. And I had heard that there would be some, some possibly some listening sessions. Um, I think it's called Malamo Hana. And I was wondering if you could explain yeah. kind of like what the skeleton, I know it's probably still forming, but um, I think it's really, important to engage the community so i'm just really curious um, to what are what are your plans for that awesome so in this last session legislative session uh, there was a bill that passed that's called malama ohana it's it's a bill that's developing a working group it's going to be housed in my office we have to start it uh, there will be co two co-chairs um, the executive director of Hale Kipa and the executive director of Epic Ohana. And what we're gonna do is, according to the legislation, we're going to pull together a large group of advocates as well as state workers um, and community orgs to develop a working group to really look at what community needs to do to reform child welfare. It's a reform child welfare bill. And it's really going to be talk, trying to have the conversation, make recommendations, look at policy recommendations, look at procedural recommendations on how child and child well Department of Human Services is is heavily is going to be heavily involved in that, uh, and so it's gonna it's gonna be a very intense working group. Um, Nakama Ahaloa has been a working group that has been in existence for many years and it's going to kind of morph from that into this very formal working group. We're going to be under Sunshine Law, so there will be a, a whole lot of transparency, which is the way it should be. We, we will invite community to participate in every conversation um, and we'll be able to, uh, we'll be going from um, community to communi community to community across the state to really ask and get a good idea of what reform needs to look like for the child welfare system. Uh, we need to stop traumatizing kids and their families um, and figure out ways to better support and nurture relationships. Um, so this is what we will be doing. We've already started the planning session, but that law goes into effect July 1st. So we'll be convening our first meeting in July. Awesome. Anybody else? One more question? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Tia Hart. Beautiful. Okay. All right.